Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and yeah, uh, happy Friday to everyone. I'm, uh, it's the end of the week. We have a great show planned for you, and uh, we hope that all of you are you know, heading into the weekend strong. So uh, yeah, welcome to the program. We have, of course, uh, for long, long time listeners, don't worry. We do have the man himself, Ralph Bond, joining us all day today for, you know, talking about uh, current event in tech, science, medicine, that kind of thing, of uh, tech stories that give you a little bit of hope for the future. Because, you know, sometimes, like yesterday, we talked about some computer technology news that made you really wonder where we're all going. And I think today is going to be a good pick me up. So. He'll be joining us in just a moment. And in the meantime, uh, before we get started, a few things I should mention, including ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything and anything for today's show. Be that the show notes, be that the uh, let's, yeah, let's show notes we have. Uh, so Ralph does a great job of collecting all the stories, uh, sourcing all of them, putting in relevant videos, things like that. Uh, it, you know, you can find everything that we talk about here today right there at Computer America. Also, while you're there, be sure to check out uh, the social media contest, which we will be giving away a prize later on in the show today. And that is brought to you by Logitech. And then also be sure to check out the live video feed. So yeah, just another way to experience the show. And folks, I mean, I really, you know, uh, it's not necessary. We're still a radio show, but I do, of course, like to show cool things like this. And this, uh, you know, this just happened today. If you hadn't noticed, there's uh, the Winter Olympics going on in uh, South Korea, uh, Pyeongchang, I believe. But uh, but yeah, no, uh, it's 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 the Winter Olympics, and you know uh, they released this video. And oh wait, actually, before we introduce the video, one we introduce the man himself. So everyone, once again, he's our science and tech trends correspondent, and you know he used to work for Autodesk, he used to work. For intel and is currently working for himself and of course joining us here every <laughs> second friday of the month ralph how you doing okay let's correct one thing i work for my wife <laughs> <laughs> no i'm kidding really, really yeah. gotta score those bonus points i like that i like that <laughs> there it is you see right off the top i'm putting myself in safe territory and you're so right about technology in the winter olympics because i believe and maybe you're alluding to this story uh, intel has put together a, what is it, something like a thousand drones with all these color light things and doing these wonderful kind of choreographed things in the sky. I haven't seen the opening ceremony yet. I'll probably watch it later this evening, but uh, maybe that's what you're alluding to. One, of course, technology yeah. is playing a huge role. Yeah, 1,218. Um, and if you look, <laughs> and, and you know, we're using Skype. So if you look in the Skype chat, I actually sent you uh, a video of it, or at least a, a GIF of it, and you can kind of click on that and see that there. Everyone out there watching on the video portion, we have it up on our screen. And yeah, I mean, these drones, they're outfitted with, you know, these these lights and they make these patterns. They have a snowboarder mm -hmm. completely made out of drone lights. Uh, the, mm -hmm. you know, of course, the winter or at least the Olympic logo flying through midair. It's super futuristic. Yeah, it's very, very cool. And in fact, in today's package of stories, we have another very innovative and interesting use of drones, but I'm jumping ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but like I said before, and you could probably reiterate this, Ralph, but uh, tell them about the show notes and why they're important. Yes, the show notes are great, folks. As Ben was telling you at the beginning of the show today, uh, what I do is I go out. My job is to go out and look for interesting stories that I want to share and this, the angle that I'm taking is science and technology trends stories that I think are interesting to share with you. So I don't compose these stories, I gather them and then I give you highlights, but along with the highlights spoken to you over the show, the show notes will give you the links, images and so forth. And we often don't get a chance to go through all of the 10 stories I pull together each month. 
notes, but the show notes give you a fun kind of homework assignment, if you want to call it that, to go back and take a look at. So uh, with that said, please go out and get those show notes. Right, right, right. And they're available right there. So, uh, but yeah, in, in the meantime, I think uh, I got to turn off this video. It's way too interesting. So um, <laughs> yeah, so why don't we go ahead and get started with, uh, of course, story number one. And, uh, you know, it, it, it it's this blending of technology and humans and i'm not sure if we're there quite yet but we're getting to the point where you know up until this point technology has played a great role in uh helping people get back abilities that they've lost you know we've seen prosthetic limbs we've seen yes. hands that can be controlled by the brain uh, it's about you know giving people back something and i think you know this story is going to highlight it but we're quickly getting to the point where we can add things to people. We can make people, mm -hmm. you know, just a little bit better with technology. And that's that's a, you know, that's a scary but cool kind of territory to explore. Well, yeah, and, and uh, not to digress from the first story, but real quickly, what you just said is what has been on my mind for the last several years. Everybody talks on and on about humanoid robots, and fine, that's great. I really genuinely believe the future is augmented humans. So ro robotic-like technology augmentation to a human being. Think of how we're doing transplants or uh, this sort of thing. That's where I think the real exciting future is in my personal opinion. Robots, great, they'll be around. But I, I think the holy grail of creating human-like robots such as you see in science fiction films and so forth is fine but I, I again i think the real pedal to the metal so to speak will be augmenting humans either for making up for deficiencies through through accidents or just you know uh, paraplegics that kind of, whatever mm -hmm. right but anyway i digress the first story <laughs> right is has a great headline and i think it's very true forget bulky controllers electronic skin may make it easier to interact with virtual reality. So we all know, what, where are we at today with virtual reality? Typically speaking, you're putting on some kind of goggle, and if you're getting more sophisticated, you're holding some devices in your hands to, to evoke through motion uh, and, and clicking buttons moving about in the virtual environment that you're exploring on the, uh, via the, thanks to the computer, right? But that's fine, but it's a barrier for real use in terms of cost and bulk and on and on and on. So this is why I like this story. It comes from a uh, Digital Trends, a story by Luke Dormel, and you can check it out. We've got the link. We've got a video in here for you, but I'll dive into the story here. And he, the story starts off with, imagine being able to interface with a computer or smart device simply by gesturing with your hand. Not just that. What if you were able to do so without a bulky remote control or the need for cameras packed with cutting edge image recognition technology that decodes what it is that you're doing? That's what researchers at the Hemholtz Zentrum Dresden, let me get the screen here, the Dresden Rosendorf Research Center in Dresden, German, Germany, pardon me, have developed with a new magnetosensitive electronic skin or E-skin, of course, everything has to be E-something, <laughs> right, guys? E-skin, uh, that's about as thin as a Band-Aid. Now, that's important. Let, this, let that sink in. As thin as a Band-Aid, but nonetheless capable of tracking supple hand movements. Here's a quote. It uses a set of eight magnetic sensors whose intrinsic properties make them suitable to detect the direction of an external magnetic field and this is from Canon Bermudez, one of the researchers on the product, as told to the reporter for Digital Times. Quote goes on, quote, by combining them in, in a specific arrangement where two conditioning circuits are perpendicular to each other, the X and Y component of the field can be discriminated and then put into a computer, which calculates the effective angle at which the external magnetic source is located. It's a mouthful, but I yeah. think you can start seeing what's going on if you kind of close your eyes and picture this kind of uh, XY field and so forth. It goes on to say, Bermudas gives several examples of how the technology could conceivably be used. One use might be a person waving their hand to adjust the volume of a song or dim the intensity of a light or screen. 
It could additionally be used in virtual reality. Now, here's where the real payoff is, you know, raising and lowering vol volume with gestures and so forth. That's that's fun and fine. But the next part of the, the sentence is really important. It could additionally be used in virtual reality as an alternative to some of the bulkier controllers people are people currently employ to interact with the virtual world. And it goes on another quote, it can also be very important in the prospective field of soft robotics. Mm, love that term. Where having conventional rigid components is undesirable as they can break or constrain motion when the soft robots get curved or twisted. Bermudas, one of the researchers continued, continues on with her quote, in the field of rehabilitation medicine, it could be used as a non-disturbing way for monitoring the rehab process of patients going through therapy or using a prosthesis. Prosthesis. I can't say that on a Friday. <laughs> you got it. It's a tongue twister for me, at least. In both cases, you benefit from mechanical compliance with conventional approaches. Uh, pardon me, which conventional approaches. Let me try that again. In both cases, <laughs> you benefit from mechanical compliance, which conventional approaches do not always provide. Right on. And it goes on to say, right now, there are no plans to commercialize the e-skin, although research on the project is continuing. Here's a quote. Our current research concentrates on improving upon the concept by increasing the sensitivity, Bermuda said. Another add-on would be to add a feedback system that can provide stimuli to the user similar to what haptics aims to do. And haptics, again, is the relating to the sense of touch, right? right? And in the end here in the show notes, I have a link to the paper describing this work as it was shown in the article. I, I just, the, what do you, the, this one article, soft robotics, I love that term. The whole idea of getting rid of bulky controllers and so forth, at least for the hand part of your virtual reality interaction, right? The visual may still have to be the goggles, but how, wouldn't it be great if we could get rid of those bulky kind of giant um, wand-like things that people are now using? So I, I love this story. I thought it was really cool. Yeah, so I'm going to send you a link um, and everyone else out there. It's uh, Bebop Sensors, and we're going to focus on this one for a second, and then I wanted to uh, kind of talk about uh, Bebop Sensors real quick. Uh, yeah. Be because, you know, this is something that... Uh, Bebop sensors, we interviewed them. Let me get this exactly right. I think it was last Friday. So that was, um, no, no, I'm sorry, last Thursday, February 1st, uh, we interviewed this company. And it's a gentleman who, who wanted a, uh, who wanted sensors that worked like cloth so that you could wrap them around things. And mm. one of the things, and everyone, uh, the reason I bring this up is because I kind of want you to go back and watch it if you didn't uh, check it out. But uh, they invented a glove. Flips over the hand. Um, it's not mm. bulky at all. And it's same thing, VR controller. And it you know, kind of measures joints and things like that simply by, by wearing this glove. And they have a couple of other um, applications for it. But it's the idea that you, know, you can fit these sensors and you can bend them. You can fold them. They're low power. You yes. can put them in multiple places. Yours is a bit different because uh, you know, the one that you found here in, in the story because it seems like extremely low powered. It seems like it just works off of, you know, uh, late, uh, that, uh, that magnetic, uh, I'm sorry, electromagnetic skin uh, as thin yes. as a Band-Aid. But I mean, sensors <laughs> are getting that super thin, foldable, bendable, durable quality yes. that we're gonna start seeing them, I think, in the next couple of years. And again, Bebop sensors was just kind of an extension of that. It's, you know, they're, they're testing this for sports equipment, for cars, for helmets, and yeah. I think, this is something we're going to see in the next couple of years. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And anything that's pliable, uh, any sensors or control technology that's pliable, flexible, thin, and so forth, to your glove example is a great one. This story was a good example. All, in my opinion, feeds into the viability of my thesis about the augmented human going right. forward. The right. human being, as all animals and so forth, are just these magnificent machines, if you will, of nature. And we can augment them. We can augment them with exoskeletons. We can augment them with artificial uh, limbs, someday maybe even functioning artificial eyes that will actually see for us, and on and on and on. Uh, I think that's where robotics has its greatest future. And the other kinds of robotics 
I, I don't want to be too absolutist, but I think the kinds of robots you see in factories today and so forth, that is going to go on like gangbusters, yeah. no end there. Oh, yeah. But the idea of walking down the street and interacting with somebody and thinking, is this a robot or is this a human being? Uh, I don't, I'm not poo-pooing it because that would be foolish to do, but I think where real meaningful uh, advances would be in augmenting humans. And then if you want to have a sci-fi movie thesis or, <laughs> or theme, it would be a future whereby there's a divided the have and have nots, the all naturals and the augmenteds. And the augmenteds would be this the, race of people that have advantages over the, the naturals. The, the only thing that keeps me from thinking about that, and, and we're going to move on to story <laughs> number two in just a second. Yeah, but yeah. The only thing that keeps me believing that from that is like, think about, um, I don't know, something like smartphones. They're accessible yeah. to everyone. Think about something like computers. They're accessible. They're yeah. accessible to everyone. Technology is prohibitively expensive when it first comes out. Eventually, mm -hmm. it becomes so cheap, so easy to manufacture that you know. I think it's not really going to be a case of the have it, have nots. It's going to be, you know, uh, those who want it and those who don't. And the availability is definitely going to be there, and that's exciting. So uh, you know. Yeah. No, it is. It's fun to think about. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So. So. But e either way, uh, they. Again, story number one, medicine, that's great. Uh, story number two, robotics, but in a different way and usable mm -hmm. in the here and now. Yes, yes. Oh, I love this story. And maybe you already heard about this, Ben, and many of your listeners may have too. It got quite a bit of play worldwide. And it's sort of like a brick to your forehead, duh. Why didn't I think of this? Anyway, here's the story. It's from BBC News, and it was carried by many other news services too, by the way. Uh, the story broke around uh, the latter part of January, in this case, January the 18th. The headline is, Drone Saves Two Australian Swimmers in World First. So we've got in the show notes a link to a fun video to, to check out. Let me get my computer to wake up. Here we go. Uh, here's the story. Two teenage boys were rescued by a brand new life-saving drone in Australia while lifeguards were still training to use the device. This is something else. They were training to use this drone and suddenly a real world need came up. The swimmers aged 15 and 17 had got into difficulties off the coast of Lennox Head, New South Wales. A member of the public spotted them struggling in heavy surf about 700 meters offshore. The lifesavers instantly sent the drone to drop an inflatable rescue pod. I love this. And the pair made their way safely to shore. Uh, Joan Barrialaro. B-A-R-I-L-A-R-O. <laughs> it's Friday. I'm not even going to try. John will say, the state's deputy premier praised the rescue as historic. Quote, never before has a drone fitted out with a flotation device been used to rescue swimmers like this, he said. And the lifeguard supervisor, Jay Sheridan, was piloting the device when the alarm was raised. So again, th these guys were training with this, right? And he described the experience as, quote, unreal. And he goes on to say, and you can just hear the Australian accent, right? The Little Ripper UAV, Little Ripper, you got to love it. The Little Ripper UAV certainly proved itself today. It is an astonishingly efficient piece of life-saving equipment and a delight to fly, as he told the Sydney Morning uh, Herald newspaper. And there's some pictures there. Uh, again, the video is a blast. Here it ends up. It says, Mr. Sheridan said it took just a minute or two to launch the drone and fly it to the rescue site and drop the pod. Any other day, reaching the teenagers, teenagers pardon me, could easily have taken three times as long, I would think maybe even more, right? Because somebody would have to swim out there or boat out there to these kids. And the drone's camera also recorded the whole rescue, and you can see that in some of the videos that I've included in the story. But I, I just love, you, you made the point about smartphones, and we've talked about this for years, Ben. Every, the ideas people come up for smartphones, somebody invents the smartphone, uh, for example, iPhone, and then all these developers go, well, with that processor and that screen and that touch capability, well, I could do this kind of app, I could do this kind of game, and the endless creativity, same thing happening with drones, and I just thought this was a wonderful story, clever as could be. Ben, you still there? Holy crap. Mike was still muted. It is Friday. Uh, so this <laughs> See, is, you're having a Friday. We'll I, call it Friday moments. I know. So, but, but uh, what I was just saying before I was so rudely interrupted by myself, um, 
no, this is the hope for new technology where, yes. um, you know, drones up until this point have been used for surveillance. They've been used for taking pictures. They've been used for uh, essentially videotaping things. And, you know, this is just the same, the same technology. It's a, it, admittedly, it's a bigger drone than usual, but it's the yes. same kind of drone. And all they did was just drop a life preserver yeah. to the people out there. I, I mean, it's, oh, yeah. it's a simple tweak on an already known technology, which is great. Exactly, and that's that's what relates to my thought about you, you create a basic entity, a smartphone, and then the developers will just come up with great ideas. You create this thing, the drone, and then developers are just going to come up with all these twists and turns that we might not have thought about initially. Oh, I've got an idea for you. If you mute yourself again in the future, you can just say, oh, sorry, folks, I was so awestruck by the sto story, I was speechless. <laughs> now I'm back. Yeah, there we go. It, <laughs> it, it left me in awe. But no, I, I mean... <laughs> Uh, I, I remember reading an article about um, the essentially the white paper for this exact same idea where they were going to implement it on cruise ships. And I remember yeah. someone patented the idea, but he's right. I've never seen it actually put into practice. And, you know, for something that's just, you know, kind of going into training uh, if and, and everyone out there watching the video portion, we actually did watch the video. Uh, I was I was almost afraid he was going to hit one of the swimmers with uh, the package. <laughs> but, I mean, the amount of accuracy that he was able mm -hmm. to get this out to them, I mean, this drone must be super intuitive and easy to handle. So it was yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I love this story. I just think it's great. And, boy, story number three is certainly germane to current news and so forth about cryptocurrencies, right? So we can dive into this story, one. This one comes yeah. from an outlet called Tech radar uh, that's the outlet story by kevin lee the head the headline i thought this was really interesting and there's a lot about this story there's some layers we can talk about but the headline is samsung is making processors solely for cryptocurrency mining move their move their decision to do this will hopefully alleviate the squeeze on graphics processing units gpu supplies and so there's multiple layers here what i've learned and you may already have known this, Ben, is that high-performance graphics cards, the kinds of things that appeal to super intense gamers or people that are in uh, very rendering intensive kinds right. of uh, occupations and so forth, uh, that, that these graphics cards, the way they're designed and the way their processors work is ideal for managing or, or implementing um, cryptocurrency mining. And then that begs the question for listeners who aren't familiar with this, and I, I needed to get myself educated on this, cryptocurrency mining, what is this? Well, it includes two functions, namely adding transactions to the blockchain, securing and verifying, and also releasing new currency. Individual blocks added by miners should contain a proof of work or POW. And the source for that little explanation is uh, benzinga.com and a story by Shanti Rexaline. Yeah, so right. this, this is kind of, you know, I don't profess to fully understand cryptocurrency. Maybe you do, Ben. I'm, but I'm, I'm pretty good at it. And, and I'm pretty good at it. And I mean, uh, yeah. uh, an interesting tidbit to keep in mind, everyone. Um, Bitcoin mining, uh, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, one of the more popular ones out there, very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and something to keep in the back of your head while we do the story is that 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 proof of work that the act of mining doesn't mm -hmm. actually do anything for society it it doesn't you know it, it doesn't uh render itself to you know rendering proteins for science it doesn't lend itself to <laughs> analyzing you know uh, sat, uh radio satellite images for seti it doesn't really do anything it's just a big waste of time just so you prove that you know, you you have a computer that's actually lending to the blockchain. So, you know, think about that while we're going through this, that it's mm -hmm. not actually useful, but if you want to get paid, you have to do it. <laughs> yeah. And again, Ben, you've got a much better grip on this whole cryptocurrency thing. I, I find it more crypto than anything else. <laughs> but right. here's the story. Uh, we'll go through the ar short little article here. It says, thanks to the cryptocurrency craze, the prices of graphics cards have been inflated to up to three times their retail cost, while inventories have been falling at all-time lows. But relief for PC gamers could be coming soon, as Samsung has announced uh, that it's making new chips specifically 
for cryptocurrency mining. Samsung confirmed to TechCrunch, a news outlet, that its foundry business is, quote, engaged in the manufacturing of cryptocurrency mining chips, close quote. Aside from the scant confirmation, a separate Korean news report from The Bell, that's the news outlet, suggests that the company will produce application-specific integrated circuits, if you're a geek, that's an ASIC, designed for single computational tasks. Among the many unknowns when it comes to Samsung's new mining chips is how this form of ASIC will be able to readily chip away at Ethereum. Ethereum, which right. I think did I said it right? Yay! Yeah. Which has classically been ASIC resistant. Ethereum isn't necessarily invulnerable to ASIC, but it's problem that but it's a problem that sounds boy, let's try that again. <laughs> but it's a problem. Talk about problems, but it's a problem that Samsung will need to solve. And the definition of Ethereum, because I needed to get this definition, is an open source public blockchain-based distributed computing platform and operating system featuring smart contract or script to, functionality. Right, to put that in a, in a bit of a different way, uh, Bit, you know, uh, Ethereum is just like Bitcoin, uh, except it uses a different algorithm for its blockchain, and it's, uh, it's, it's a bit more private. It's a bit more, uh, you know, mm. think ethereal, Ethereum. Um, it's used by a lot of people it's just a it's think of it as a rival to bitcoin same same idea same concept just another coin out there so gotcha gotcha and i love the base of the word ether which is this vaporous kind of you know right what's stuck if you know or the etymology of that word but anyway okay now I'll finish up the story the Kore korean electronics firms move into cryptocurrency world may seem like a curious one but the company has already deeply involved in mining. A majority of the graphics cards, cards used in mining feature Samsung's high-capacity memory chips. So they're already deep in the graphics card world, so why not just roll that over into this world is basically what they're saying in this article. Going on, it says, and while Samsung is largely known for its smartphones and QLED 4K TVs, the company recently toppled Intel as the world's largest chip maker. Sad for us as for the United States, but that's the facts. So this latest initiative could help solidify its position in the silicon arena. Hopefully, Samsung's move into ASIC chips can help take some of the stress off of the world world stockpile of gpus but we can also easily see the company's burgeoning focus on the mining world cutting into the availability of memory supply for graphics cards so you know it's just an interesting trend i just thought this whole thing of cryptocurrency and a, a giant like samsung now coming out and saying we're going to develop a processor specifically for that i thought that was interesting there are definitely a couple layers to uh, talk about here, and uh, we, we'll keep this short because we're about to run into a break here in about two minutes, right. Ralph. But um, one is that cryptocurrency, I mean, it had a stellar month. I think last time you were on, we, we talked a bit about this, where uh, Bitcoin had gone up like, uh, and, and again, uh, all cryptocurrency across all markets mm -hmm. uh, saw a huge gain, but we saw Bitcoin specifically go up from like, uh, like a thousand dollars or something like that, up to right. uh, fourteen, fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars a coin. Um, oh, so, in 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 that way, it's very interesting to companies. They're like, hey, we we got to get in on this. There's really nothing else out there that we can get, you know, a thousand percent returns or a hundred percent returns. Uh, no, no, it's definitely a thousand, a thousand percent return <laughs> uh, in just over a year. And people were like, oh, this is awesome, Ralph. Since the story was written and since we're reporting on it now. Over the past nine days, the price of Ethereum, because they seem like they want to mine Ethereum specifically, you can mine any coin and then transfer it to any other currency. Yeah. Um, since the time of this story, Ethereum has gone down about uh, $400. Um, you know, so wow. it went from like $1,200 down to $800. Wow. Uh, you know, and, and it really shows that, like, you know, you, these companies, they, they move slow. You know, when you develop a whole new product, that takes... And yeah, I'm sure Ralph, you know this better than most. When you do, you know when companies bring out a new product, it's months of research and development, months of production, and then you finally get it to market. Maybe a year or two after. Uh, yes. My point is, is like they can bring this out, but 
I mean, who knows what the price is going to be and if these things are even going to be desirable when they do. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point about development time. You're right. Yeah. So anyways, uh, very interesting, though, that Samsung, because again, Samsung is a huge chip developer. And of course, let's take note of it. So everyone, the music means we're going to take a break. Continuing on with us, Mr. Ralph Vaughn. And we'll be back in just a moment. Everyone, stay tuned. More Computer America after this. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 31 minutes past the hour as we continue on here. And yeah, Ralph, if you're still there, um, before we get back... Perfect. And before we get back to all this uh, great technology science uh, stories, why don't we talk about, well, our winner. And this is a you know company, Logitech. I'm sure most of you have heard about them. They're a great company. And hey, they sponsor the giveaway a prize here on the program every single Friday. So Ralph, if you wouldn't mind helping, if you could grab the drumsticks and we'll announce a winner. I'm ready. All right, here we go. Wow. All right. Drum sticks turn into trumpets. Good job, Ralph. So uh, with that being said, I'm, I'm playing with you. I know trumpets, but whatever. All right. So this week's winner is Mr. Don C. Don C, who all he had to do was enter using Facebook. He followed us and yeah, listens to us in North Hills, California. Yep. North Hills, California. So Don, if you're out there listening, thank you so much for listening. And uh, yeah, congratulations. We're going to contact you. We have your email address and we'll get it over to Logitech and get your prize shipped out to you. So just like that, another winner. And if you want to be next week's Don C, all you have to do, computeramerica.com and check it out. All right. So all that being said, and you know, uh, we could talk about cryptocurrency forever, I think, (laughs) on the program. But instead, I think we're just going to go ahead and move over to story number four. And, you know, I like when you bring lists like this because, you know, it gives you a chance to kind of see what a lot of people are doing without having to focus on each individual one. So talk about story number four. Yeah, sure. So I thought it'd be kind of fun. I I found this article and I thought it was great. Some of these podcasts, of course, I was familiar already familiar with. They're very famous, at least if you're a science fan. And uh, it's from Business Insider. And it's a story by Kevin Loria. And the headline is 12 of the best science podcasts that will make you smarter. That's kind of fun. And we're not going to go through all 12. I just uh, kind of quickly highlighted the first five of the set that he put together Mm -hmm. and just wanted to share it with everybody because if you're not familiar with some of these um, shows, it would be a great idea to do that. And I'm actually going to uh, kind of skip over his intro because I want to get to some other other stories because as Ben can tell you, and if you've been with us uh, on when I do the show once a month, we almost never get through all the stories. So I'm going to skip through and just go right to the first five sure. and encourage you, everybody, please go get those show notes because it'll have the link to the original article. You can see all 12 of the podcast they recommend. They're all great, but I just want to say a few words about each one here. So let's jump right to the first one, Hidden Brain. And if you're not familiar with this show, this is fabulous. NPR show Hidden Brain takes deep dives into one of the most complex objects we know of in the universe, the human mind. Covering everything from psychology to neuroscience, host Shankar Vedanta investigates why people act feel and think the way we do. This guy's great, by the way. Uh, Verdanta looks at how parents do and don't 
shape their kids' minds, the ways humans cope with the unexpected, and why our attention can be sucked into the Internet for hours at a time, and so much more, right? So Hidden Brain, folks, NPR. I, many of our listeners may already be familiar with this, but that's I agree with Kevin. This is a real winner. Very, very good. The cool. next – yeah, it's a good one. Have you have you listened to it? I I have. It's a, it's a wonderful. You know, show. I, I I don't think I've heard uh or not not heard of. I don't think I've listened to that one specifically. I'm a huge fan of NPR. Uh, I listen to it in the car. Yeah, I, me too. I, it's uh, it's just what I do. But and you know, I think it's what a lot of people do. But no, um, and, and again, I'm check, probably gonna learn. Check it out. Yeah, I, I'm probably gonna learn as we do this list as well as our listeners. So yeah, cool. So yeah, hidden brain. Uh, a plus recommendation for me. Next one, the story collider. This is interesting. In this personal storytelling show, individuals recite their own tales similar to The Moth, and there's a link there to help explain what that reference is, but they're all focused on science and more specifically the ways that science touches people's lives. It's a science-themed show about people. In some cases, scientists tell stories about things they have uh, that have blown their minds or gone horribly wrong. In others, you might get a heartwarming, heart not worming, heartworm, <laughs> that's a dog problem. In others, you might get a heartwarming or heartbreaking tale informed by science. And some stories are just funny. So check that one out, The Story Collider. And again, if you have the show notes, we've got the links for you. The next one, Star Talk Radio. While some podcasts focus on humans or life on Earth, Star Talk talks, uh, pardon me, takes a much larger scale approach hosted by science popularizing astrophysicist, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. This guy's great. The show takes on the cosmos. Tyson discusses what it would be like to live on Mars, the search for extraterrestrial life, and occasionally dabbles in other scientific topics. Boy, I'm having a Friday here. Top dabbles in other scientific topics <laughs> like technology and football or the new science of LSD. Yeah. My generation goes, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Star Talk is great. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Star Talk, and I will say this is probably uh, one of the ones you have on your list that, you know, I have I have actually listened to. Um, you know, Star Talk is is in my mind, a little bit different than uh, the others that you have here. Yeah. Because yeah. Star Talk, like I think they also have a sh a TV show that they produce. They go to a university yes. and they produce a TV show. And you know, I don't think every podcast becomes a TV show. I think it's you know maybe like a dozen become the TV show, but um, it's it's a bit higher production and the pacing is a bit different than traditional mm -hmm. podcasts. So like yeah. I liked it, but it's not your traditional podcast. So. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. And Neil deGrasse Tyson is, is a really interesting character. If you're not familiar with him, friends, get the show notes and check it out. It is. It, it's interesting stuff. Yeah. The next one, the next one is called Radio Lab. Radio Lab is one of the classics of the podcast pantheon. And for good reason. Co-hosts Jad Abumrad and Robert Krolwich have a brilliant way of breaking down topics to find some of the most fascinating stories we've ever heard. In recent years, Radiolab has expanded its topics beyond science to tell stories about politics and other themes from all over the globe, but the episodes still bring the same insightful perspective to anything they take on, and the team still happily delves into the science of microbes, gene editing, or human psychology as they investigate the mysteries of the world. And the last one, number five in the list of 12, so there's others to see uh, and listen to, is Invisibilia. Love that name. There's probably no better format than an audio show for the discussion of things we can't see yet are fundamental to our lives. Gotta love it. On Invisibilia, hosts Alex Spiegel and Hannah Rosen explore the invisible forces that shape human behavior. Things like ideas, beliefs, assumptions, and emotions. Episodes examine how two people can see the same thing in completely different ways. That sounds like a husband and wife scenario. Interesting. <laughs> how we understand our own personalities and how the clothes that we put on transform ourselves. How about that, huh? So those are five out of 12. Check it out. Get those show notes. So two things, uh, same thing, two different ways. So I guess 
you know, and, and I had this growing up, you know, uh, I would be in my room and my mom would come in and say, Ben, your room's a mess. And I would go, no, it's organized chaos. And I <laughs> felt like I could completely understand it. Well, of course, you know, my mom being the observer would go, this is horrible. And it's like, no, this is, this makes sense. So no, I, mm-hmm. I, I and, and, and invisibilia, I will admit something else I hadn't checked out, but, um, you know, and this is the kind of idea that I get when, whenever I put on Computer America or whenever, you know, I listen to some of these things in my car is that, you know, there are people out there that have an hour commute every day, you oh, know, yes. two times a day. There are people out there who have downtime. And I think one of the best ways to pass that downtime, music is fun. Music is great. You don't want to be listening to a podcast while you're at a party. Um, but, you know, people who need to fill that time and would otherwise uh, just be either extremely bored or listen mm-hmm, to music. Mm-hmm. I think podcasts, Computer America, Invisibilia, any of these 12 podcasts that you have or more, um, it's just one of the best ways to pass time. So I'm glad that you brought more to people's attention. Well, yeah, and at the beginning of the show, you were talking about uh, our show being a place for upbeat, positive things on technology, not always, mm-hmm. but trying to kind of go a little more in the positive vein. And so... You can listen to music, as you said before, or you can listen to the news and get really depressed, <laughs> right? Yeah. Occasionally uplifted. In fact, my, my wife and daughter were saying, thank God for the Olympics. Yes, the, somebody may fall down on skating and, and it's sad and everything, but it's such a nice change of pace from the politics fighting, stuff, yeah. fighting and politics and world problems and Kim Jong-un doing whatever, mm-hmm. right? So I agree with you, these podcasts, if you have a long commute, uh, what a great way to spend your time. Anyway, with that said, we'll pop on over to story number five. This one's interesting. This was this really caught my I attention. I have to ask you, Ralph, have you yeah. ever had a chunk of fool's gold? Yeah, I, I have. Yeah, of course. I, I, I had a huge one. I brought it to school. I showed it off to all my friends. I'm like, and, and like and everyone who hadn't seen it before, I was held in my hand and I went, yeah. check it out. I have a huge chunk of gold. And they go... Uh, wow, that's amazing. I go, nope, you're a fool. This is fool's gold. I was like, <laughs> like yeah, I felt exactly. so smart in second grade. And now I, I realize I was just a jerk. So please, yes. story number five. <laughs> yes, fool's gold. Yeah, that that's actually brings up a good point. A lot of listeners might know not know right off the top what is fool's gold. Well, it is, as you say, it's a mineral and so forth. But we'll jump into the story here again from Gizmodo. The headline, once again, is fool's gold suggests ancient life in oxygen oasis far before there was atmospheric oxygen let that sink in for a second because we all know oxygen was uh, created over time and built up to the point where we got what we now are destroying called the atmosphere right right <laughs> hey, gizmodo story here by ryan mandelbaum and again the link and so forth is there for you this is a really cool story it's going to take a little time to dig into uh, but i think it's worth it You wouldn't survive a stint on the hellish early Earth that existed between 2.5 billion and 4 billion years ago. There was almost no breathable free oxygen, for one thing. But scientists may have located an ancient oxygen oasis that existed prior to whatever event first oxygenated (laughs) our atmosphere. A team of researchers analyzed pyrite, a.k.a. fool's gold, found in South African rock formation thought to be the remains of an ancient tide pool. Comparing the different isotopes, same element, different amount of neutrons in its nucleus, of sulfur and iron iron revealed evidence of oxygen in these near-shore shallow marine environments despite an overall oxygen-less atmosphere. This suggests that early life could have formed prior to whatever great ox- oxidation event oxidation resulted events, in, right. thank you, thank you, resulted in the higher oxygen levels in the atmosphere that allowed life to flourish. And it goes on with a quote here, photosynthesis must have been in, in a Pardon me. Photosynthesis must have been evolved, study author Benjamin Eichmann from the University of Tübingen at the University of Johannesburg told Gizmodo magazine. 
goes on with the quote, because photosynthesis is the only process that is capable of accumulating free oxygen to an extent that this oxygen could have formed these oxygen oases. He thought that some bacteria must have been present to produce the oxygen. Now it goes on, scientists commonly use ratios of different elemental isotopes preserved in rock samples as proxies to understand the elements on Earth during its early years. In this case, the pyrite, sulfur, and iron isotopes contain the signature of oxygen in the shallows of the ancient oceans, despite the fact that the overall atmosphere didn't have oxygen and they published their paper recently in Nature Geoscience. Last little part here, Maya L. Gnomes, writing a commentary for Nature Geoscience, pointed out that the study relies on an assumption that the pyrites actually preserve information about this kind of near shore, shore environment, which may or may not be true, meaning to say this pyrite may or may not have been in a shallow tidal pool, TBD. Right. And confusingly, the signatures demonstrate the oxygen decreasing before the great oxid oxidation event left its mark on ancient sulfur. So, I mean, but it just, it's just interesting to think of a world potentially at some point that had pockets of oxygen before our whole atmosphere was created. And I just thought that was an intriguing thing to think about. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure how many people know, know this about me, but uh, in, in high school, my my academy my discipline was environmental mm. science so oh cool you know and, and and it's always cool to hear new things about environmental science you figure that you know there's a lot of researchers out there doing a lot of work and we should know mm. pretty much everything we need to know and then something like, like this comes along and you know we knew that oxygen was introduced into our atmosphere plankton and tide pools blah 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 but you're right you know this idea of pockets and communities mm -hmm. springing up over the course of billions of years, I mean, God, that's yes. super interesting. So very cool find. Yeah. It's, it's the, everything about the earth just freaks me out. I mean, we think how old the world is and how old the universe is. It's just all too and weird. And that there's I still just stuff to find. That's the exciting part. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Endless stuff to find. Right. Including the next story. <laughs> story number, yeah. Uh, the, and, and this one, I mean, folks, uh, before we get into it, I just gotta say that uh, again, we have a video portion. Uh, stories such as these, you know, the show notes such as these, um, you can go find them yourself. But if you're watching the video portion, we're going to take a look at the pictures because this one is kind of seeing is believing. Yeah, this is a beautiful image. So the story also comes from Gizmodo, another story, uh, also by Ryan Mandelbaum. And the title of this one is, This Picture of Jupiter's Swirly Blue Pole is Magnificent. I couldn't agree more. And you can see the image, as Ben was uh, saying, if you're on the show notes. I'll get my computer to wake up here. There we go. Um, beautiful picture. Gosh, it's just gorgeous. It almost looks like, a, you know, those great geodes and stuff, those weird stones and stuff with the colors and everything. Anyway. I thought you were going to uh, say a Van Gogh. Picture. Say what now? I thought you were going to say a Van Gogh, uh, Starry Night. Oh, okay. We'll go with that. I like that better. <laughs> Right. So what he says in the article, the author says, I'm not usually one of those check out this beautiful planet photo people, but seriously, the images coming from the citizen scientists looking at Juno data, Juno's the uh, probe, right, are all incredible. I'm not sure how this latest one can even be real. And it is absolutely stunning image. I mean, yeah, of course it's real. You're looking at the planet's turbulent gas clouds of different molecules swirling around the largest planet in our solar system. Some say Jupiter's most striking feature is its great red spot. I'd argue it's the deep swirling blues at its poles. Very cool. Now, Juno, again, this is a probe, snapped this image with its Juno cam on December 16, 2017, when it was almost 65,000 miles from the planet's cloud tops, according to a NASA uh, press release. That's pretty far, a distance greater than eight Earths stacked on top of one another. Jupiter itself is about 11 Earths in diameter. The raw data for these images is all available on the Mission Juno website. We have a link in here for you folks. For people like you to process, citizen scientists 
Gerard, or Ger Gerald, pardon me, Eichstadt, Gerald Eichstadt, can take credit for this amazing image. And if you're not good with computers, you can still see some pretty fabulous views of Jupiter with a telescope. Anyway, take a break and enjoy this picture of space. And it's just a stunning picture. I love it. Yeah, there are a lot of great photos also on NASA. He links to it in his own article um, <laughs> you know, where all these photos are found. And like for people who weren't paying attention, uh, this probe flew by. <laughs> It's the difference between you know photographing it with sat with uh, I'm sorry with uh, telescopes. It's the difference between a you know one of those disposable cameras and something like a super high, uh you know DSLR photo. Like yeah, the, the resolution that Juno sent back is something to really really see for yourself. So it looks gorgeous. I I, I can't blame him. You know. Again, that big red spot, that was about the only, I guess because of the contrast, everything is white on that red spot. Um, but when you do actually get a chance to you know, kind of get under the planet and see those blue poles, those things are stunning. Yeah, they're really freaky, weird, and cool looking. I, I just, just great. So the next story keeps us in space. Sure. This is from an outlet, Newser, N-E-W-S-E-R, story by Jen Gidman. Headline, Huge Glaciers found hiding beneath Mars' surface. Subtitle, scientists already knew they were there, but they've just seen them in a whole new light. And of course, I had to check this one out. There's a great image in here. There's a high-resolution res, high image of the massive ice scarps on Mars, and scarps are like a bank or a slope, right? So here's the story. It says, scientists already knew that water ice lurked below Mars' surface. So that was not a surprise. But a new study published in the Journal of Science sheds new light on what Space.com calls apparent glaciers seen anew thanks to high-res imagery, imagery pardon me, from the high-rise camera on NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Using this data, researchers found eight spots on the red planet that had been eroded with steep slopes, slopes pardon me, of ice sheets or scarps reaching from just below the surface, meaning it wouldn't be hard to get to if humans or robots ever get there, to more than 325 deep, uh, pardon me, 325 feet deep. There you go. The images which render the ice in 3D show discrete layers within the ice, which could offer clues on how climate change has affected Mars. Wait! Mars has climate change problems? Hey, how about that? The scientists believe the ice was once snow that fell when Mars' axis was tilted more prominently toward the sun. That snow has since evolved into massive, fractured, and layered ice. And I was just kidding about Mars having climate change. That's the greatest example of climate change probably you could think of off the top. The ice sheets are located at latitudes that would be equivalent of Scotland or the tip of South America on Earth, per NBC News. Here's a quote. It's like having one of those ant farms where you can see through the glass on the side to learn about what's usually hidden beneath the ground, study co-author Shane Byrne uh, says of the detailed imagery per the outlet phys.org, phys.org, org, pardon me. Although right. scientists haven't yet figured out how these ice scarps form, they do know that once they peek out into the atmosphere, they turn from ice into water vapor, a process called sublimation, and retreat as they get taller and wider. The ice chunks could even prove handy as water sources if and when humans ever touch down to explore the planet, the study notes. I love this part. Astronauts could essentially just go there with a bucket and a shovel and get all the water they need, Burns says. What's up with those Mars scratch marks? <laughs> is that ending little phrase. But that's kind of intriguing to think that you could go and you know what also weirds me out, Ben? It just weirds me out. We you know, here on Earth, water, 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 lots of water, right? Right. And it's still just kind of weird to me to think that an entirely different planet, there's water. It, 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 you, think, you have to think to yourself, Duh, yeah, that's kind of interesting. You know, there's a lot of these sort of 
things about maybe life having come from Mars and been transported here through asteroids or whatever. You, you did, you get the, but the whole thing about water on that planet once upon a time is incredibly intriguing since water is sort of the petri dish of life for at least of us on Earth. So yeah, I, 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 I mean, think about if, if anyone <laughs> is super interested on that kind of thing, uh, you know, to point back to one of our previous stories, uh, Star Talk. I mean, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson does a good job of introducing to the kinds of ideas you're talking about, like, you know, mm -hmm. coming from Mars, um, mm -hmm. you know, comets that we see in the sky, that trail that we see, that is ice melting as it gets closer to the sun. I mean, Weird, ice, huh? ice and water are actually pretty common, and we didn't know that before. So that's why it's yeah. exciting is that life needs water, and there's actually a lot of it. So it's cool. Um, it's food for thought. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and Ralph, actually, uh, we have time for just one more story, I think. And if you wouldn't mind, if we could skip over to story number 10, because it's a it. little bit more recent, um, but it's also keeping with the space theme. So I figured, hey, you know, last 15 minutes, we'll stick with space. So story Yeah, there 10. you go. It's, since I've been so spaced out on my ability to read the stories, <laughs> <laughs> and we've had space themes, let's stay spacey. Okay, right. here we go. So this is from BGR, story by Mike uh, Wiener. And it's the title is Lost NASA Satellite Wakes Up After Being Declared Dead 13 Years Ago. Very cool. So here's the story. NASA has a pretty great string of luck when it comes to spacecraft reliability as of late. Boy, that's so true. The Cassini probe around Saturn proved to be so reliable that its mission was extended multiple times. And the Juno probe, we were talking about that a moment ago, uh, hanging out around Jupiter is already being considered for a mission extension thanks to its steady performance. Now, something completely unexpected has given NASA's hardware profile another boost, as a satellite thought to have been dead for well over a decade has suddenly awakened or woken back up. The IMAGE, all caps, it's an acronym, IMAGE satellite, which stands for Imager for Magnetopause to Aurora Global Exploration, and Aurora was the ancient Roman goddess of dawn, by the way, was initially launched way back in early 2000. The spacecraft was designed to observe the plasma levels around Earth. It performed well for its first two years in service and was granted a two-year extension for continued research, but then went dark in late 2005. One final try to make contact with the satellite in 2007 failed, and NASA declared the satellite dead. That is, until an amateur astronomer stumbled upon a signal from the satellite just two days ago, and the, the story date is, let's see, what was the story date? It's January 31, so it's not too terribly right. long ago. Um, now I need to get back where I was. Oh, yeah, amateur astronomers stumbled on the signal from the satellite just days ago, indicating that it was very much alive. Quote, the identity of the satellite rediscovered on January the 20th, 2018, has been confirmed as NASA's image satellite, NASA says. Further quote, on the afternoon of January 30, the John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab in Laurel, Maryland, successfully collected telemetry data from the satellite. The signal showed that the spacecraft ID was 166, the ID, of, ID for the image uh, craft we're talking about. The NASA team has been able to read some basic housekeeping data from the spacecraft, su spacecraft, suggesting that at least the main control system is operational. Now, it goes on to say, in order to actually make contact with the satellite, NASA had to do a little bit of software time travel. Now, that's a fun phrase. The various programs and databases that were used with the satellite have been upgraded and replaced in the 13 years since it went silent, and the agency has been forced to revive some antiquated software so they could speak to the satellite's language. NASA says it could take a couple of weeks to actually determine the full status of the satellite and its various tools, but if they can get it back up and running, they they may be able to gather data from its instruments so that's you gotta love this kind of stuff i, I mean, think it's cool yeah I, I, you know closing statement we're about to uh close out the show here but i will say that uh since you were you know since you uh, found this article i think it was just a couple of days ago i had heard that they it's official they can't actually communicate with it they can't give it orders they can't receive information uh. because the hardware they had a you know they had a hardware controller for it that had been thrown out, you know, housekeeping in like oh, the right. pursuing 13 years, the hardware oh, was thrown away or lost. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, so it's not no. just software, but it was hardware. And so, hey, it's alive, but uh, actually talking with it, impossible. But 
uh in the meantime great stories ralph there's still two more folks if you want to go out and check it out but uh yeah. ralph thank you so much and uh if people want to find out more about you and what you do where can they go hey just do a search for ralph bond and maybe the easiest thing is just go ralph bond wix because my website is on uh, wix website yeah. that'll easily take you there I have information about my work with this show and also some of my freelance work that i now do since i'm quote unquote semi-retired <laughs> again and also and as always congratulations to that and thank you for joining Thanks. us here on computer america looking forward to have you back next month so everyone out there thank you for joining us here on computer america be sure to tune in uh, monday because we will have a show on monday let's see featuring a uh, fuse play fuse play is scheduled to be on with us and we have many guests all next week Folks, have a great one. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.